I want to welcome you back into the Tell Me Teaching series, and in this particular series is what I'm being is what I've been working on through our Sunday school. Here, uh, I I belong to a local church here, which is called Iglesia de la Gracia de Cusco, which is the Grace Church of Cusco here in Peru, and I have the opportunity every Sunday to teach through principles to get us to, to get us to move forward as a body, but also to be disciple as we move forward in our Christian world. Walk. And I want to draw your attention to the book of Psalms, chapter 90. In the book of Psalms, chapter 90, I want you to open your Bibles there. And because I want you to, and we're going to be going, looking at this text in a little bit, but I need to provide some background information first before we begin to read the text here in Psalm, chapter 90. And we're titling this series, God's Time, Your Time. God's Time, Your Time. This is a psalm. This is the psalm of the sand, okay? Psalm 90 is the psalm about the sands of the hourglass and the shadows of the sundown, okay? And when you sense the brevity and the, fra and the frailty and the end of human life, this is what this psalm is about. And this psalm happens to be the psalm that Moses wrote, which is actually the first psalm that was ever written written. And I want you to understand this <clears throat> as we begin to unpack this idea. <clears throat> Excuse me. So what I want to draw your attention to as we begin to look at this is a couple of concepts. First of all, the church, the purpose of the church. Now, the church has many multifaceted functions and sides to it. And the function, and one of the main functions is to disciple people, disciple them to become more like Christ, more like Jesus here on earth. And we have three basic concepts that we're going to be looking at to, as we go into this next series. We just finished our series on what is the gospel. What is the gospel? We spent 16 weeks going through this in, in, in our Sunday school. And everything that we're doing is for the purpose of discipleship. For the purpose of discipleship. I'm not interested in information. What we're interested in is in transformation. Moving people forward so that they would be more Christ-like, but they will be functioning, collaborating members of the church. And so this is what we're doing here. Now, but we, one of the areas that we fail to understand is time. Time seems to get away from us. We don't seem to understand time. Time, that little hand on the clock, okay, it never stops moving. Time continues. It moves, it moves, and it moves. Just look at yourself in the mirror and you begin to realize you know what? Time has passed and moved a lot long. Um, it moved a lot faster than I had anticipated. So I want you to look at this thing just briefly. I'm going to explain this in more detail as we go through this. Okay? But I just want to kind of establish the parameters of this issue of time. Jesus Christ was able to disciple his disciples in three and a half years. He was able to do what most of us will never be able to do in 200 to 500 years of time. Just think about this for a moment with me. Jesus spent 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days for three and a half years with his disciples. He was able to train them. So let's look at this idea of time before we begin to look at the concept of it okay, inside the scriptures in Psalm chapter 90. Now, I want you to understand, one day has 24 hours. One hour has 60 minutes. 24 hours has 1,440 minutes per day. And so if you took a 30-day month, okay, that means that in 30 days in a month would be 43,200 minutes in a month. If you took 365 days one year, that means there's 525,600 minutes in a year. That's a lot of time. Okay? So let's look at this concept of time in hours, okay? One hour is 24 hours. Seven days is 168 hours per week. 30 days is 720 hours per month. In 365 days is 8,760 hours per year. Now, if you're going to church, and I, and I deal with a lot of pastors on these issues, okay? So let's take the typical Sunday school hour. Sunday school is basically one hour. We agree, right? Mm -hmm. So one hour is 60 minutes. So that means that in 52 Sundays, you have met for 3,120 minutes per year. In 52 Sundays, you have met for 3,120 minutes per year. Now, when you look at that, that amount of time, okay? 
You know what that represents? Out of five, listen, out of, out of, um, 5,000, out of 525,600 minutes, that's a half a million minutes, out of 525,600 minutes out of the year, Sunday school only represents 0.0059% of the time. That's, that, that's barely a half a percent of a time. Now, if you took the Sunday service, now I realize that I'm, I'm dealing with pastors and I probably deal with pastors in 54 countries, 118 languages, okay? And we, and we work with about 12,800 pastors around the world. Just think about this for a moment, man. In a typical Sunday service, now everybody has a different thing, but let's just narrow this down for the purposes of our conversation here, that a Sunday service is 1.5 hours, 90 minutes. Okay, it's one and a half hours. Okay, so that means that in 52 Sundays, that represents only 72 hours, 78 hours in the entire year. But the entire year has 8,760 hours. But Sunday service alone is only 78 hours if it's an hour and a half. Okay, if it's an hour and a half, and I realize that other people have longer services, I understand that. But I'm talking about the time of instruction. Okay. We're looking at only 78, 78 hours out of the entire year. You know what that represents? That represents 0 0.0089% out of 8,760 hours out of the total time of the year. These are, in, these are insignificant numbers. Now, if you combine Sunday school and Sunday service together, if you took the 52 hours of Sunday school and the 78 hours and you put them together, okay, okay for the entire year, that's 130 hours per year out of 8,760 hours per year. That means that on, that only represents 1.48% out of the total time of the entire year. These numbers are absolutely insignificant. No wonder we have trouble trying to disciple our people to move forward. Now, let's look at the other side of this coin here. Let's look at what Jesus did in three and a half years. Now, I realize, of course, that you and I cannot do what Jesus did. But I'm doing this purposely. I'm pointing this out purposely to show you the great challenge that we face as pastors in the churches. Okay? Jesus discipled his, his, he, he discipled his disciples for three and a half years. So let's look at the numbers of this. If you took 365 days or 8,760 hours per year, okay, that means that 8,760 times three years is 26,280 hours and three years. And if you took a half a year, okay, at, and you add a half a year to that for the three and a half years, okay, that's adding another 4,380 hours, okay, which means that Jesus had the ability to disciple his disciples for three and a half years for a total of 30,660 hours. 30,660 hours, that equals three and a half years, okay. Now, Go back to the other side of the coin. The average teaching time, the average teaching time is one hour. That's the average teaching time is one hour. Okay? That means that 52 Sundays only represents 52 hours. Now, if you were going to achieve what Jesus did in three and a half years, and remember, Jesus invested 30,660 hours discipling his, his, his disciples. It would take you and I 500, so if you took 52 hours and you divided that into 30,660 hours, okay, it means that it would take you and I 589 years to achieve what Jesus did in three and a half years. Now, but let's say you combine one hour of teaching time in Sunday school one hour of teaching time in the Sunday service, okay? That means that that would be a total of 52 per 52 equals 104 hours out of the entire year. And remember, the entire year has 8,760 hours. Hmm? Now, if you were to achieve, you wanted to achieve what Jesus achieved with 12 men. He turned the world upside down with 12 men, okay? 
So if we added another 52 hours, that'd be a total of 104 hours. That means that out of 30,660 hours, okay, divided by 104, it would take you and I 294 years to achieve what Jesus did in three and a half years. Let me remind you again. For you and I to do what Jesus did in three and a half years with only one hour of instruction per Sunday, uh -huh, that means that it would take us 589 years. If we did it in two hours of Sunday school and at the Sunday service of teaching, two hours of straight teaching, and okay, discipling your people into the Word of God, it would take us 294 years. Do you understand the concept of time? All you need to do is to look in the mirror and realize that time has not stopped. The clock keeps ticking. The hand keeps moving. Okay? And it just doesn't stop for us. Just look in the mirror and you realize that time has not stopped. So I want to look at this idea in, in terms of how we disciple our people. They need to grasp the understanding of time, the biblical concept of time, not the cultural concept of time. There's a profound difference between the, the, scriptural, the scriptural concept of time and the cultural concept of time. And so I want to go into this particular psalm with you, okay, in the next few weeks as we begin to unpack some of, some of the subtleties and the nuances that are involved in the life of a believer. Mm -hmm. Now, and before I do that, I want to remind you of something. Now, I live in Peru. I live in, in South America in the, in the city of Cusco in Peru and South America. And I've been here now almost three years now living here. And since since I left the United States, I'm a full time missionary. I am a member of a local church, Grace Church here in Cusco. Okay, and we have a pastor. His name is Pastor Joe Martinez. Okay, and um, I, I, I am I, I am obviously you know the senior member here. And and all I'm here to do is to help a pastor to grow a church, and right, and for the glory of God, and help him to grow and mature and strengthen him as I you know as I have stepped down to being the senior pastor in my church back home in the United States. And so I'm a full-time missionary. I teach on the television full-time. I teach on radio full-time. And, you know, and this is what I do. And I train pastors around the world full-time. But I want you to understand that time is crucial. Now, back in the United States, back in 1965, in, on November 8th of 1965, November 8th, 1965, there was a what was called a, a telenovela. It's a, a soap opera, a TV soap opera. Okay? And, and and it was called the days of our lives the days of our lives okay and it was and it was and the lead actor was a, a gentleman by the name of McConnell Carey McConnell Carey he was he, he was born in 1913 he died in 1994 he was about 80 80 81 years old somewhere in there okay and he was a well-known actor and he had an opening line an opening introduction to his TV soap or telenovela okay and this is what 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 he had okay and and I and, and I remember, and the reason I remember is because my sister, okay, loved to watch this thing, okay? And, you know, and, and I had aunts and, and neighbors, and they were watching, and, you know, they would always talk about this thing, right? And I remember I looked at it once, and I found it silly, but, you know, that that's my problem, okay? But I want you to understand something. And this was the opening line that William McCary would say at every single program. It was a half hour at Digley. And in fact, do you know that, that that TV program, The Days of Our Lives, is still on the air today in the United States. It's still on the air today. Just think about this, okay, with me. Now, this is more than, this is more than 60 years is on the air. And he, this was the opening line. Listen to the line very, very carefully because this is going to set the stage for Psalm chapter 90. This is what he said. Like the sands through the hourglass, so are the days of our lives. Like the sands of the hourglass, so are the days of our lives. This is McConnell Carey, and these are the days of our lives. And this, and once they would hear the music, people would see the hourglass, okay, and they knew the time for the program was on. So that's what I want to address with you here. God's time, your time. This is a psalm of the sand. Psalm 90 is the psalm about the sands of the hourglass and the shadows of the sundial. Okay? And when you sense, when you sense the brevity of life, when you sense the frailty of life, when you sense the end of human life, 
this is the psalm that the, that the prophet Moses spoke to us about, okay, in the days of old and are still true today. I want you to open your Bibles to Psalm chapter 90. And let's look at this together in Psalm chapter 90 and listen to these words as we begin to unpack them, okay, little by little. We'll start with verse 1 and we're going to read the whole we're going to read the whole text in its context before we begin to detail the teaching. And he says here, starting in verse 1, Psalm chapter 90, he says, "Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations." Before the mountains were born, or you gave birth to the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn back into dust and say, Return, O children of men. For a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it passes by or as a watch in the night. You have swept them away like a flood, and they fall asleep. In the morning they are like grass which sprouts anew. In the morning it flourishes and sprouts anew. Toward evening it fades and withers away. For we have been consumed by your anger, and by your wrath we have been dismayed. You have placed our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. For all our days have declined in your fury. We have finished your, our years like a sigh. We have finished our years like a sigh. For the days of our lives, they, are contain, they, they contain 70 years, or if due to strength, 80 years. Mm -hmm. And yet their pride is but labor and sorrow, for soon it is gone and we fly away. Who understands the power of your anger? and your fury according to the fear that is due you. So teach us to number our days, that we may present to you a heart full of wisdom. Teach us to number our days, that we may present to you a heart of wisdom. Verse 13, he says, Do not return, O Lord, how long will it be, and be sorry for your servants. O satisfy, O, o satisfy us in the, O satisfy us in the morning with your loving kindness, that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. Make us glad according to the days that you have afflicted us and the years that we have seen that we have seen evil. Let your work appeal to the servants and your majesty to their children. Let the let the favor of the Lord God be upon us, and confirm for us the work of our hands. Yes, confirm the work of our hands. I want to begin to look at this song because one of the biggest problems that we're facing today, and we're in this postmodern era in the life of the church, is that the church is now being driven by young people. It is being driven by young people who have no experience, okay? They haven't been around long enough, and there's nothing wrong with being young, so please do not misunderstand me. But what we have done, what we have failed to see is that we as pastors and as congregations, as church members, we've allowed that the energy, the complete driving energy of the church is now the young people, and that is absolutely wrong. I want to speak to you older members, okay? You are the force behind the church. You are the strength behind the church. You are the experience behind the church. You are the wisdom behind the church. You should be more energized than the young. The young are energized by their physical youth, but they have no direction. It is the older members who've understood like the sands through the hourglass, so are the days of our lives. It is the older members who understand, just like he told us in Psalm chapter 90, verse 12, so teach us to number our days that we may present to you a heart of wisdom. And, uh, and what, but instead what happens, we older members, we retire, we sit back, we have a remote in our hands, and we just live off of the laurels, the laurels of yesterday, what we did yesterday. No, 
You're to serve the Lord to the last day. And yes, you will serve him in pain. You will serve him in agony. You will serve him, but nevertheless, you will serve him for you are not done yet. You must leave a legacy behind. You must leave, you must, and you must invest your life in the life of the younger ones for, because soon they will become the older ones. So this Psalm that was written by Moses, okay? And it talks about when you sense the brevity of life, when you sense the frailty of life, when you sense the end of human life. Now, in our introduction, as we grow older, okay, the brevity and the frailty of life become increasingly more and more real to us. We look back on our lives and wonder where, where the years have gone and how they have flown by so quickly. It seems that we are, we are hastening. We're on the express train toward death, with the days speeding by faster and faster than ever before. Sadly, many of us will shed, will shed bitter tears of regret over words spoken or not spoken. And I have buried a lot of people. And I am amazed how many people go to their on their deathbed with and, and they struggle with great remorse. What they could have said, what they should have said, but they failed to say. And so many, many words that have spoken or unspoken, okay, have been left. Left into the recesses of the mind as we're speeding toward that final end of our service here on earth. So many of us will shed bitter tears of regret over words spoken or not spoken, deeds done or deeds not done, and the days that I cannot be relived. You and I cannot relive our days. I wake up every day with great pains in my body, realizing that the aging process is winning. It is winning because that's how it was ordained by God. I don't have to fight this thing. I will not fight this thing. We spend millions and millions and millions of dollars trying to stop the inevitable. Whatever state that I'm in, and as I fall into decay, as my body falls into decay, to my last breath, my goal, my purpose is to serve him to the end, which is the reason why when I retired from the United States, I went to the mission field. I will serve him in the mission field, and I plan to die in the mission field. Psalm 90 mourns the brevity of life. Psalm 90 mourns the frailty of life. Psalm 90 mourns the end of human life. It is, it is only inspired, it is, it is the only inspired psalm that was written by Moses making it the oldest of all of the Psalms. Its content leads us to conclude, it, to conclude that he wrote it during the 40-year period when the Israelites wandered in the wilderness because of their unbelief and disobedience. That's when this Psalm was written. Moses would have been somewhere between 80 and 120 years. Can you imagine that? He had to be between 80 and 120 years old at the time, which means that he had already lived well beyond the expected lifespan. Let me draw your attention to Psalm chapter 90, verse 10. Psalm chapter 90, verse 10. He says, as for the days of our lives, they contain 70 years, for or if due to strength, 80 years. Yet their pride is but labor and sorrow, for soon it is gone and we fly away. Moses had already lived by this time, by this time historically and chronologically in the Bible. Okay? He had already lived beyond the expected lifespan, very much like for us today. With the brevity of life, okay, and the certainty of death, in the in the clear in the clear focus, okay, than ever before. It's in the clearer focus than ever before. Moses' heart was heavy for his people who would waste the rest of their days in the wilderness. 
And this particular psalm clearly was arranged by God's people into five books that correspond to the five books of the Pentateuch. Okay? So Psalm 90 marks the beginning of book four. Now remember, the Pentateuch is the beginning of the Bible, right? We have Genesis, right? Okay. We have Exodus, right? Right. We have Leviticus, right? Right. Right. So, so we have these books, right? We have Numbers and Deuteronomy, right? So these are five books. The Book of Psalms, okay, which is you know 150 chapters, okay, is is divided into those into five books. Okay, and if you don't realize this, Genesis, Leviticus, I mean, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, okay, correspond to all five other books in the, in the book of Psalm. And Psalm 90 is the beginning of book four in the book of Psalms, and it corresponds to the book of Numbers. Mm -hmm. Okay, and which correlates to with the book of Numbers, right? And the, which is the fourth book of the Pentateuch. Okay, it is appropriate that Moses' prayer is the first psalm in this book, since the faithless Israelites, okay, failure at Kadesh Barnea, okay, and their subsequent years of wandering recorded in the book of Numbers. So now. What you have to understand that if you took the fourth book of the book of Psalms, which would be Psalm 90 all the way to chapter 106, Psalm chapter 90 all the way to Psalm 106, that's the fourth book of the book of Psalms, okay? Now, the main subject in that section, it talks about peril and protection. Peril and protection. In other words, it has earth in view. Earth in view. We're living here on the earth. And this is what begins the fourth section of the book of Numbers in the Pentateuch of the Psalms, okay? It opens up with a prayer of Moses. Hmm? It is the only psalm of Moses that we have, okay? Moses was the first writer of the Bible, and you would naturally think that this psalm, okay, that his psalm would, have, would be the first one. If you or I had arranged psalms, we would probably have placed it at the very beginning, right? That's what we would have done. But we did not do the arranging of the books of the Bible. And I am of the opinion that God supervised even the arrangement of the, uh, 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 of the Bible, okay? Even the arrangement of Psalm, because Psalm chapter 90 falls into a place in such, it falls right into place in such a wonderful way in the fourth book of the book of Psalms, okay? Now, the book of Numbers. The book of Numbers records the great tragedy, okay? The great tragedy, the tr a great tragedy of the generation of dying in the wilderness, never reaching the goal, which was the promised land. How appropriate it is to begin with the, to begin this Numbers section in ninety and the prayer of Moses. And there is a correlation for us to today. So the entire theme here is the prayer of Moses. Now, let's talk about the setting. The setting of this psalm, okay, is out, is out there on the desert during Israel's wandering. That's the setting of this psalm. You recall that when the people of Israel came out of bondage of, of Egypt, okay, they were first led to Mount Sinai where God gave them the law, right? And we know that the law is, was recorded over there in, in Exodus chapter 20 and in Deuteronomy chapter 5, right? And they went up there to enter into the promised land, but instead of entering, they turned back to that frightened and frightful desert. And that, that's, that's the, what's absolutely, that is astounding here. They had seen the hand of God over and over and over and over again. And what happens? What happens? They turn back to that frightful desert. For 38 years... For 38 years, they wandered in the desert until that generation died. Moses saw a lot of people die. In fact, he witnessed over 2 million of them die, and his psalm is the psalm of death. Can you imagine? Now, in my, in my lifetime in ministry, okay, I buried over 20,000 people. I cannot even conceive how Moses buried okay, over 2 million people. He watched 2 million people die. You cannot imagine how heavy his heart was. To me, it is a remarkable song. 
In fact, listen to this, quote unquote. It was Martin Luther who wrote this. Martin Luther said this about the psalm. He said this, just as Moses acts in teaching in the law, so does he in this particular psalm. This is a teaching psalm. For he preaches death and sin and condemnation in order that he may alarm, he may alarm and shock the proud who are secure in their sins and that, and that, and that he may set before their eyes their sin and the evil. My friend, that is the teaching of this particular Psalm, Psalm chapter 90. Psalm 90 is a psalm about the sands of the hourglass and the shadows of the sundial. It is a psalm about time. It's a psalm about time, past, present, and future. What is accomplished in our lives will have much to do with what we do with the gift of time that has been given to us by God. We either master our time okay, or we become slaves to the time. We use time or time uses us as and wears us down when we, okay, when we kill it or abuse it. We can either waste our heartbeats in the sands of our hourglass that God, that God has given to us and wonder why we don't have enough time. Or we can make wise use of our days okay, that, will lead, that will lead to bringing honor and glory to the Lord Jesus Christ with our lives. So here are the issues. And here's the question. Okay? Here's the question here. What do you do with your time? I am addressing our Sunday school class. I am addressing the members of our church. Okay? What do you do with your time? Because tomorrow is not guaranteed. You will be held accountable by God. We're sitting there with a remote in our hand, wasting time away, not understanding that we're, we are slowly marching and, 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 and picking up speed on this express train toward leaving this earth. What do you do with your time? That's the question. Is the Lord a part of your schedule or is he left out of it? And truth be told, for most people in, in the church, I'm talking about believers, he's left out of it. It was William Penn that said this, and it sticks, it just, it doesn't let go of my mind. William Penn said, time is what we want most, but use worse. Time is what we want most, but we use worse. And this chapter, chapter 90, puts time in perspective for us. It speaks, it speaks of the source and it speaks of the swift and of the swiftness of time in our lives and concludes with some wisdom about what we ought to do with the sands of our hourglass. And if we are wise, okay, we will adopt Moses' prayer, which is Psalm chapter 90, as our own prayer. Not only will it help us to prepare for eternity, okay, but it will also help us to live wisely. Less like the rebellious Israelites, we waste our brief lives in disobedience and in, and in unbelief. This is when we sense the brevity of life, when we sense the frailty of life, when we sense the end of human life in Psalm chapter 90, verses 1 through 17. And I want to divide this psalm into three major sections. Three major sections. Number one, acknowledge God's love and care. Acknowledge God's love and care. That's verses 1 and 2, Psalm chapter 90. Second section, I want to divide this. Recognize the problems of human mortality. Recognize the problems of human mortality. That's verses 3 to 11. Verses 3 to 11, Psalm chapter 90. And then the third section, or the third major point here, appeal for God's mercy and help. Appeal, appeal for God's mercy and help. That's verses 12 to 17. So be, let's begin to break this psalm down. Okay? Because everything that we do in Sunday school is, to, is discipleship, discipleship, discipleship. We're driving people to serve in the kingdom of God, to serve in their local church, okay, to serve in the community to be the beacon light inside of a darkened world that we live in. We are to look at the sands of the hourglass of our time. Time is not guaranteed for us beyond tomorrow, not even today.
So let's begin with the first one. Psalm chapter 90, verses 1 and 2. And that's point number one. Acknowledge God's love and care. You first have to be a grateful people. He says this in verse 1 and 2. He says, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were born, or you gave birth to the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Moses began his prayer by acknowledging God's great love and, and, and faithful care for his people. That's, the, that's what he's talking about here. He illustrated God's boundless love, okay, for us within two with two endearing endearing images, that of a loving home and that of a loving parent. Look at this. He is our dwelling place. He is our refuge. He's our home. He's the oasis of love and security. Look at this in verse 1. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. As the homeless Israelites, they wandered through the wilderness, okay? Moses realized something. He realized how little our worldly residence really matters. You know, I had to come to that conclusion. Everything that I had in the United States really didn't matter anymore. I understood that there was something beyond all this. And people question, well, why at this stage in your life, at this age, okay, would you walk away from everything and go to the mission field? Just the same way the Israelites left Egypt with everything behind, okay? And they were headed to the promised land. That's exactly where we are. We are headed to the promised land. Moses realized how little our worldly residence matters. It doesn't matter. From the very beginning of Israel's history, when God called Abraham to leave the Ur of the Chaldees, they had been a nation of nomads. A nation of nomads. They were a nation of wanderers. They were a nation of travelers. People on a journey. Even at this stage of my life, I'm still on a journey. Through every kilometer, through every mile, however, they have been cared for and protected by God. Even now, as they paid the price for their unbelief, God was with them. Now, this thought is what leads Moses. This thought is what led Moses to confess that God had been their dwelling place, that God had been their refuge, that God had been their security, that God had been their home, God had been their habitation, God had been their comfort, God had been their place of rest. Is that who God is in your life? And as the author of the book of Hebrews said this, and he noted this, okay? He said, they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. They were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Turn your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13. And the, and, and, and the author of Hebrews says this, all these died, they died in faith without receiving the promises, but having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on earth. That may seem silly to you, but that's how I see my life. All I am is a stranger and a pilgrim on earth. I'm just passing through. What was true for the Old Testament saints, listen to me, what was true for the Old Testament saints is true for the church age believers as well. Did you hear what I just said? What was true for the Old Testament saints is true for today for the church age believers as well. We are described in the New Testament as strangers and pilgrims. Turn your Bibles and listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit in the voice of the Apostle Peter. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11, this is what Peter says. He says, Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers. I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against your soul. Now, let me just in parentheses stop here. Just in parentheses here, okay? I have a term that I use that kind of needs to be explained. Listen, we understand eternity past, eternity present, eternity future, even though those are contradicting terms, right? We have we have an eternal concept, okay, being tied together to a temporal concept, but it's the only way that we, we, we understand it, okay? Uh, 
But you need to understand something. There is, now listen to me carefully, there is the gospel of the past, the gospel of the present, and the gospel of the future. Did you hear what I say? There's the, the gospel of the past, the gospel of the present, and the gospel of the future. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is this, okay? That Jesus Christ went to the cross 2,000 plus years ago, okay, to achieve the gospel, the good news, to pay the price, okay, of our bad news, which is our sins upon that cross. That's what I would call the gospel of the present. Almost all church members understand that. They understand that 2,000 years ago, the gospel of the past, that's what happened. Okay. And then into the future, one day you and I are going to die. Yes, let me, let me tell you, we are going to die. We will pass from this life. We will pass from this earth. We're going to die. And for the believer, we understand there's a gospel of the future. That we'll enter into the kingdom of heaven and into paradise. We understand that. Okay, so we understand the gospel. We understand the past and the future. We understand the gospel of the, of the past and the gospel of the future. We understand that we get those concepts. The problem where you and I are struggling is the gospel of the present. So what is the gospel? The gospel, broadly speaking, is the whole of Scripture, everything from Genesis to Revelation, from Revelation back to Genesis. It's how you and I live our time now on this earth as pilgrims, as aliens, and as strangers passing through. Because all of our heavenly rewards depend upon the life that we have led here on earth. So now Moses has a grasp on this concept. We are not citizens of this world, but of heaven. You heard the voice of Moses. You heard the voice of Peter. Now hear the voice of the Apostle Paul. Okay? We are not citizens of this world, but of heaven. Turn your Bibles to Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we are eagerly, for which also we eagerly, eagerly wait for a Savior in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me repeat that. For our citizenship is in heaven, for which also we eagerly wait, we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Interestingly enough, when discussing our earthly needs, both Jesus and Paul mentioned food and clothing, but neither mentioned shelter. That was astonishing to me as I was, I was going through the scriptures, okay? okay? And where do we spend most of our time? In our property, in our homes. Isn't that true? You build a home, you buy a home, and you spend the next 50 years paying for it, right? And you have to spend 30, 40, 50, 60, 80 hours a week, okay, working, earning to pay for something that you barely spend any time in, okay? And while you're doing that, it's decaying, it's deteriorating, it's falling apart, it's rotting, okay? So you need to understand it. Now, I'm not a, so don't, don't, don't misunderstand me, but that's the truth. That is the truth. Now, God, okay, it's interesting that Jesus nor Paul in the New Testament don't even mention your dwelling place. But where is the church age believers today? You are focused in on property, 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 house, house, house. Gazillions amount of money are being spent, okay? And you're frustrated through it all. Let me show you this. Turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. And look at me in verse 25. Matthew chapter 6, verse 25. For this reason, I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on. It is not life more than food and the body more than clothing. Where's your house? Where's your condo? Where's your condominium? Where's your apartment? Where's your residence? He doesn't even get mentioned. Look at Matthew chapter 6, verse 31. Just food for thought. Food for thought. And in Matthew chapter 6, verse 31, he says, Do not worry then, saying, What will we eat, what we will drink, or what we will wear for clothing? Did you see that? What will we eat, what we will drink, or what we will wear for clothing? Your house, your apartment is not even mentioned. Well, listen to the Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 8. You heard the voice of Jesus in Matthew 6, 25 and Matthew 6, 31. Now hear the voice of the Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 8, where he says, 
If we have food and covering, with these we shall be content. If we have food and covering, with these we shall be content. They understood something that we failed to understand. They understood that God is our home. God is our home now and throughout eternity. The second major thing that we begin to see here, go back with me to Psalm chapter 90, verse 2. Psalm chapter 90, verse 2. And that is that he is the creator. The one who gave birth to the universe. A picture of parental care. A picture of parental care. Let me show you this. Psalm chapter 90, verse 2. In the New American Standard Version of the Bible, which is the version that I teach out of okay, in English. He says, before the mountains were born or you gave birth to. Wow. Before the mountains were born or you gave birth to the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Well, in the King James Version, it says it this way. But before the mountains were brought, were brought forth, or ever, thou, or, or ever thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Now, God is our dwelling place. God is is our dwelling place he is eternal from everlasting to everlasting moses declared he is god now i remember years and years ago j vernon mcgee okay the great bible teacher j vernon mcgee okay he explained this this idea in this verse in psalm chapter 90 where he says where he says it this way he says and and both version nasb a king james version says at the end even from everlasting to everlasting you are god both versions say the same thing well, no. now i want to focus on that just that little part right there everlasting to everlasting and i remember this many many years ago and i had to go look it up okay and J. Ren McGee said this. He says that word everlasting is in the Hebrew language is the word olam, olam. And now we would spell it O L A M, olam. Okay. And now we in, in English we would say olam. Okay. But it's olam. And and olam, O L A M. Okay, is the word everlasting. And this is figurative speech. Okay. It's figurative in the Hebrew. It means this, J. Renner McGee says, it's quote unquote. He says from van from the vanishing point to the vanishing point. Wow. From the vanishing point to the vanishing point. God is from, from the vanishing point in the past and reaches to the vanishing point in the eternity future. Just as far as you can see from vanishing point to vanishing point, he is still God. All this temple stuff is going to be gone. All of this is going to be gone. Moses firmly stated that God is the creator, the one who gave birth to the entire universe. Before the creation of the world, before there was anything else, God existed and he brought all things into existence. He brought forth and, okay, or, or, or it was born. Now, when, when, when we look at this verse here, when we look at this in, in, in the NSAB version, he says, before the mountains were, you were born or you gave birth to, and the King James brought forth, you formed, okay? And now the, that, that phrase there, okay, in the Hebrew is yalala. Is Jalad, okay? We would spell it Y A L A D, Jalad, okay? In the Hebrew word, and and from for giving birth, okay? And and then when we look at the word in the King James, formed or you gave birth to, that phrase there is the word kul, okay? It's C H U W L, C H U W L, and it's used for labor pains that accompany childbirth, okay? So let, let me show you this. Turn your Bibles to Psalm chapter 29, verse 9. Psalm chapter 29, verse 9. And he says, The voice of the Lord makes the deer to calve. Okay? Makes the deer to, makes the deer to calve. Okay? And strips the forest bare and his temple, every, everything. And in his temple, everything says glory, 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 glory. Right? Listen to the voice of the uh, the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah said it this way in Isaiah chapter 26, verse 17 and 18. Isaiah chapter 26, verse 17 and 18. He says, as the pregnant woman approaches the time to give birth, she writhes and cries out in her labor pain. Thus, thus were, were we before you, O Lord. We were pregnant with, and we writhed in labor. We gave birth, as it seems, only to the wind. We could not accomplish deliverance for the earth, nor were inhabitants of the world born. See, the picture here is clear. Okay? God is the divine parent 
of the entire universe. God is the divine parent of the entire universe. Just as a mother lovingly cares for her child, God cares for his creation, especially the human race. He loves us so much that he gave us his son to redeem us, right? We understand that. In John chapter 3, verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that he who believes in him shall not perish but have what? Have eternal life, right? We understand this. In Romans chapter 5, verse 8, he says, But God demonstrates, he already has demonstrated, okay, his own love toward us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We understand that. In Romans chapter 8, verse 32 says this, He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him for us, or, or for, delivered him for us all, all, that's the emphasis here, he, how will he not also he, with him, how he will not also with him freely give us all things. J just think about this for a minute. Just, just think about it. As stated, as stated earlier, God is our home. God is our home both now and throughout eternity. Listen to the 19th century great preacher, Charles Spurgeon. He expressed this thing beautifully. Charles Spurgeon, quote, unquote. He said, to the saints, the Lord Jehovah, the self-existing God stands instead of mansion and root tree, in roof tree, he shelters, he comforts, he protects, he preserves, and he cherishes all his own. Foxes have holes, and the birds in the air have nests, but the saints dwell in their God, and have always done so in all their ages. Not in the tabernacle or in the temple do we dwell, but in God himself, and this is what we have always done since there was a church in the world. We have not shifted our abode. King's palaces have vanished beneath the crumbling hand of time. They have been burned with fire and buried beneath mountains or ruins. But the imperial race of heaven has never lost its real habitation, its regal habitation, where, where dwelt our fathers a hundred generations since, there dwell we still. Our dwelling place is God. It's God. He is our refuge. He is our security. He is our shelter. We abide safely and peacefully in Him. As our Creator, He did, in a sense, give birth to us. As a mother conceives and gives birth to a child, so God brought us, the entire human race, into existence. Spiritually, He is our Father. We were born again through the repentance and the faith in the person of Jesus Christ, and we are born spiritually into God's family. These endearing images remind us of how much God loves and how faithfully he cares for us. Life on earth, on the other hand, often, let's be honest, it weighs us down. It weighs us down with trials and trouble of one sort or another. I mean, if it's not one issue, it's another issue. I don't ask God what else is going to happen because I'm afraid of that answer. Let me tell you something. Every day I experience something new. And I'm going, well, here comes something new. And here comes something new. I didn't see that coming before. I didn't see that coming before. And it comes and it comes. It's just one hit after another. It is a hit parade of trials and tribulations. Thankfully, but as believers... We have an open invitation from our Lord to abide in Him and Him alone. Let me show you this. Open your Bibles to John chapter 15, the Gospel of John chapter 15. Look what he says in verse 4. He says, Abide in me and I in you, and as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither, he says, neither can you unless you abide in me. He is our refuge. We can return to him at the end of each day for comfort and rest. In him we find protection. In him our needs are absolutely supplied. Though rejected by the world, we are welcome and accepted in him. We should always be careful to acknowledge God's love and care for us and to praise him for all of our days. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, he says this, Jesus said, he says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He is our refuge. In John chapter 15, verse 7, he says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. 
The Apostle Peter said this in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7. He says, casting all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. In Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 3, back in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 33, verse 3 says, Indeed, he loves the people, all your holy ones are in your hand, and they, fo and they follow you in your steps. Everyone receives your word. In Psalm chapter 91, verse 1, he says, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. In Psalm chapter 91, drop down to verse 9 and 10. He says, For you have made the Lord my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place. No evil will befall you, nor will any plague come near, to, near your tent. Listen to Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 3. He says, The Lord appeared to him from afar, saying, I have loved you. I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have drawn you with loving kindness. Like the sands of the hourglass, so are the days of our lives. This is Eddie Alfonso, and the days, and these are the days of our lives.